Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to tell a little story here from the past, because it will be streamed in the future. Uh, thanks also in particular the organizers for uh, welcoming me and my pup into their conference. Uh, so yes, I'll take off now. Right, so what I'll be talking about is quantum natural language processing. I stole a cartoon here from Konstantinos Meganetzidis, who I'm working with on these things, among some other people. Uh, so a few years ago, 2008, at Oxford University, there were three people. There was this person, uh, Mernush Sadrzadeh, who knew something which is called uh, grammar algebra. So what is grammar algebra? Grammar algebra is a thing you probably would associate with people like Chomsky, but there were also more mathematically oriented people doing that, like Lambeck. And basically what they came up with was a piece of algebra, which is such that the elements in the algebra represent grammatical types. And the rules are such that if you string a bunch of words together, say, and they together form a sentence, then the maths will tell you that. So, so Mernush knew, being a logician, she knew about all that stuff, which dates back like 70, 80 years already. Uh, somebody else who was there was Steve Clark. And Steve was sort of more a practical NLP person. So he knew how to represent meanings by vectors. Now people speak about vector embedding, like you use deep, deep learning to actually learn these meanings and things like that. At the time, there wasn't that much learning around, but Steve was like a, one of the world top people doing that still is, by the way. And then somebody else who was around there uh, was myself. And I was in the process of developing categorical quantum mechanics, uh, which at the time was still being development which now is, is like a very mature field, and you can find this in this big book here. Uh, I know in the, in the era of quantum technology and, and quantum industry now, people speak quite a bit of ZX calculus. You see this in many of the big companies. So ZX calculus, for example, something you find in this book, because it completely fits within this, this story of what I was developing, categorical quantum mechanics, picturing quantum mechanics, whatever name you use. It's a diagrammatic formalism for quantum mechanics. Now let's go back to the previous topic. So there was this grammar algebra, which was about grammar and linguistic structure. And then at the same time, there was also these vector space representations of meanings. Uh, and they were completely independently living entities, despite of the fact that they were both, of course, about language, two very important aspects of language. Uh, what are the meaning of words? And how do you put words together to make the meaning of a sentence. And so there was a question, how can we combine these two? Mathematically, they lived in completely different worlds. One was sort of algebra, uh, logic. The other one was more well, kind of category theory, even already to some extent. The other one was really vectors living in a vector space. So how do you combine these two? And then uh, we were all li literally in the same com corridor. Uh, we actually came up with a solution. And one, one way to say what we can, which question we kind of answer this, why are there no dictionaries for sentences and are there only dictionaries for words? Because if you know the meaning of a word in a sentence and you understand the grammatical structure of a sentence, well, if it's grammatically well formed, then typically you will understand the meaning of the sentence. And how you do that, compute that, is basically using categorical quantum mechanics. Uh, I mean, that's what we come up with because categorical quantum mechanics happen to embed both this grammar algebra and this vector space NLP. So how does this work? So this is a diagram which you could interpret as categorical quantum mechanics. If you go to Vienna to speak to somebody like Philip Walter, uh, he can implement this on his, on his optical tables. He can literally do this on his optical tables. Uh, what you see there, like on the top of the picture, like which are labeled Chi and H and Bob, you can just think of it as states of a physical system. And then the, the thing with the dot is actually a GHZ state. And then the, the, the single, the single dot is something like a plus state. It doesn't really matter what they are. And then the bottom part, they're bell measurements, uh, bell, bell, bell effects, so post-selected bell measurements. Now, linguistically, I can go back a slide. Uh, these are the meanings of words, like she and H and Bob. However you establish them, they are vectors representing meanings of words. And the other bit is, the other bit is grammatical structure. Oh, OK, now that was the. Sorry, that was a bit, that's not a no problem. So the other bit is grammatical structure. Uh, so where do you find this? You find this in a textbook like Lambic's book uh, from, from word to sentence, and it'll tell you how 
you form these things for a given given sample. So it's, it's just grammatical structure. But what you see here, the same diagram represents a physical implementation and a representation of linguistic meaning. Um, right. So, I mean, we solved, like, I think, in a deep problem in the sense that nobody had before uh, combined grammar and meaning where meanings could live in, in spaces like vector space. Actually, what we did didn't even depend on vector spaces. Your meanings could live wherever you want them to be. And then some people did experiments too. Uh, they, they, they experimented with, with kind of benchmark problems people in natural language processing are doing, and they kind of uh, outperformed whatever was around. So that was all good, that was all great, but there was a big but. On the slides, a small but, but, but it was actually a big but. And uh, the big but is the following, that this grammar meaning blend is exponentially expensive classically. Uh, I mean, it's not a surprise. We're using a quantum model to combine meaning of grammar. This is not a quantum model because quantum is a cool word. It's it just it canonically was the thing which combines the spaces you want to have and the way you want to compose these spaces. It's literally what you get is this sort of quantum uh, categorical quantum mechanics diagram. That's what you get. But if you look like in a big sentence like here, all these wires have to be tensor together because we are working with tensor products. So typical dimensions of these wires would be thousand and maybe even a million dimensions. Uh, so you can imagine if for a word like if, if you have to tensor all these wires together there, you get just untractable size. I mean, there are ways to work yourself to some extent around it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been able to outperform anybody doing that. But it's, I mean, it, it, it's a problem. It's a problem. So at that time, uh, Will Zhang, who's also speaking at this conference at some point, uh, he was my PhD student. And so we considered, well, can we stick this stuff on a quantum computer if there are going to be quantum computers? Because we are still going a couple of years back now. And uh, of course, uh, the, the main motivation was getting rid of the, this exponential blow up from the tensors. But on the other hand, we also considered, would this give any speed up? And, and it did. I'll say something more about that later. Now, this is, was still like thinking, like falter on quantum computers. We assume things like uh, QRAM, which doesn't exist. So we had to do a follow-up to that, much more recent. And we, we checked how we could put this stuff on like near-term quantum computers with this team. Uh, instead of QRAM, we, we considered variational circuits and, and things like that. Anyway, we came up with a template. And meanwhile, this has all been implemented. Now, I'm not going to go through the data here because the data is meanwhile, since I submitted my slides for this talk, outdated. And it's definitely, definitely going to be big time outdated by the time this talk is going to be streamed. So, the, I mean, I'm just saying we did that stuff. Now we're actually working already with a corpus of uh, 100 sentences at the moment. So what is going to be when this talk is going to be uh, streamed, I don't know. It's going to be a lot more. Uh, anyway, uh, so what are we really doing here? What we are doing is we assume some given corpus of sentences, which we assume to be true. That, that's just the task we're doing it. Like I say, we're now working with a corpus of, say, 100 sentences. Then you got your quantum computer where we, where we use the variational circuit paradigm. And then the variables in the circuit are actually word meanings. These word meanings are within the context of sentences, also within the quantum computer, because the circuit structure actually represents the sentence structure, grammar and all that. So we're training all these words, giving some so some given corpus of 100 words. And then once we have established all these word meanings within the quantum computer, then we can start asking questions to the quantum computer. And so we do question answering. We do question answering. So we give them some, some information, and then we ask some questions. That, that's the game we have been playing. And the information we put in are not like individual words. They are like sort of sentences which we assume to be true. And from that, within the quantum computer, the word meanings are inferred. So that, that's kind of how it works. So it's as a paradigm, it goes beyond even what people are doing now in classical uh, NLP, like sort of structure and grammar awareness here is much more than people standardly do in, in NLP, classical NLP. Uh, okay, so again, data, I'm not going to say much about it. it, all nicely converges and it works, it works fine, even with the much bigger corpuses that we are using now. Let me sort of emphasize what, what are sort of the key points of this approach. So. So the first point, of course, it is quantum native. What do I mean by quantum native? It's kind of quantum native, just like 
uh, simulating quantum systems is quantum naive. We use a quantum model for combining grammar and meaning, and it's not just like I said, because we, we think it's cool to call something quantum. It is just the thing where here, these wires are on the nose, how grammars look like. In, 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 in you go to a book like, a recent book like Lambeck, they look like that. And then these other things are just factors. So the way to stick them together is there is no additional stuff here in this picture than the factors and the grammar. Uh, so it is quantum native, just like uh, simulating quantum systems is quantum native, I would say. Uh, secondly, uh, it's NISC native. Now, this is a more, this is a story which, which took a little bit longer to figure out. So, but like I said, like, like these things, this grammatical structure is, is, is classically naively, if you take it naively, in any case, exponentially expensive. It's exponentially expensive uh, to encode classically. Now, if you assume that your variable circuit manner, way of like getting data on a quantum computer is a given, is a given, is a given context, you can't get around, then this grammatical structure comes for free on a quantum computer, generally for free. It doesn't cost you anything. It goes from exponentially expensive to costing nothing. Why? Because here you see a grammatical diagram. Here you see a grammatical diagram. I'm pointing at the screen, whatever. Here you see a grammatical diagram. Uh, and you can just deform it using the ZX calculus, which I mentioned before. You can deform it into a quantum circuit using the ZX calculus. By the way, uh, so Ross Duncan, with whom I developed, the ZX calculus is, I think I have to do this. Yeah, he's sitting there on the bench. If you can see that, there is Ross in the middle next to these two other people. And by the way, also Will Zeng is here. Will Zeng uh, is sitting here. Yeah, so Will Zeng will be speaking at this conference and Ross will be speaking at this conference too. So they, they, they were so nice to join me at the, as the audience. So, so anyway, here you see the, here you see the circuit that came from this linguistic diagram. And so now uh, I can say in a more sort of quantum machine learning terminology that typically people who are doing quantum machine learning, they have these circuits and, and the shape of the circuit they usually refer to as an ansatz. An ansatz is a, it's, it's something yeah, you just do because it happens to work. It happens to work, it leads you to nice results, but it doesn't mean something. So in our case, what usually is an ansatz in the, within the variational circuit paradigm for quantum machine learning is linguistic structure. So it, it's, and you get it, it's something classically exponentially expensive, which you get for free here. So it's very nice. And it's my own opinion. It's more than an opinion. We, we can substantiate this already. That this is not just a story about language, the same sort of encoding of structures that are, well, structures of the real world, so to say, say in terms of the shape of uh, the circuit when doing variational circuits, can can be applied to other things like uh, like like cognitive processes which are more related to our senses, uh, visual representations of the same things. So we are, we are working on these sort of things to to actually get these much more richer representations of uh, of, of yes of of real world stuff in terms of quantum circuits. Uh, right. So another big point I want to make here is that. Uh, use of diagrams is so fundamental here in many different ways. First of all, like I showed you in the beginning, you take a, a linguistic diagram and you can just interpret this as a categorical quantum mechanics diagram. They're exactly the same. And it, it's very hard to see how else you would do this. The sort of pictures I showed from very big grammatical sentences, they are completely unmanageable in, in anything like Hilbert space representation. It, and it, so, the, so the correspondence is really in terms of these diagrams. Now, maybe even stronger is a translation of such a linguistic diagram to a quantum circuit using, using ZX calculus. I think it's fundamental that you use ZX calculus there because you really have to, to, to build your C0 gates with dots of different colors, which is actually what, is, what ZX calculus is about. You really have to do this to move from your linguistic diagrams to your quantum circuits. Um, okay. So, well, like I mentioned already before, so there is quantum speed up. That's the sort of thing uh, initially Will Zeng and I looked at. We actually haven't spent much time looking in, into this because I do think that many other quantum algorithms can be used uh, here in this context. So we really only use like the nearest vector algorithm. So, so the way this works is you see this on the left top, you see question mark hates Bob. So you have to think of this sentence. 
who hates Bob? Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to substitute the question mark with lots of other different words uh, of potential candidates of hating Bob. And we're also not really interested in the meaning of the sentence, who hates Bob. What we're, what, what we're interested in is whether it's true or false. So we kind of just, if you want to, we trace out or we delete whatever outputs that diagram had. And so you see in the little calculation on top, you end up with what's an inner product between hates and question mark tensor block. So, so I'm, we're going to basically look what is the best uh, candidate for question mark, like uh, are I done? And we're going to maximize, maximize this. And this is really how you can do some question answering. You can ask who hates Bob, and that's the sort of thing we've been implemented implementing on the, in the experiments we've been doing, this sort of algorithm. Uh, right. Uh, but usually we only make binary choices to, to, to keep life easy, for now at least. Uh, right. So, so we are starting now, as in last month to say, really, from 1 October, we've started with a big team at Oxford under Cambridge Quantum Computing to really dedicate to this particular su subject of quantum natural language processing. Uh, we're both exploring the practical implementations on quantum hardware as it is available now. And we're also doing some classical simulation and also pushing the classical agenda a bit further uh, for things that actually can't really be implemented yet today. But like other things which have come up in this field, even before we consider quantum hardware or quantum computers, was the use of density matrices to represent meaning. Because just like von Neumann came up with density matrices to represent ambiguity about the quantum state, ambiguity is incredibly important in, in, in language meaning and all that. And uh, the, the machine, putting language on machines, like ambiguity is really important. So, okay, so. What else would you use than density matrices to do that if you're working with vectors anyway? So just this is just an example of other things we have been doing. But I see I'm sort of slowly running out of time. And I want to leave some space for maybe a question, one or two questions in the last minute. So let me say that not now, but by the time this talk will be streamed, there will be two papers on the archive, which are now being finalized. One which is called Foundations for Near-Term Quantum Natural Language Processing. And this tells the whole story in great detail, 40 pages or something like that, about what I've been saying now, like all the background and the details to what I've been talking about now is in that first paper. And in the second paper, Grammar-Aware Question Answering on Quantum Computers, that reports on the experimental results we, we literally obtained this week. Uh, so it goes beyond what was even in the slides of this talk. So that will be there. Uh, and if you want then to know what's going on by then, you can ask all of us, uh, all the people on the paper, what's the current state of the art. Uh, we're all a bit bored in these COVID days, so, so I spend a lot of time uh, giving crazy talks with skeletons, like with people here behind me. And if you're interested and you're bored in the, and you want in the evening to see a crazy talk, you can, for example, watch that one where all my audience was participating in actors. I think I'll stop here. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. See you in the future.